From 12 News, your local election headquarters, this is Newsmakers. With just over four weeks to Election Day, new insight into the mood of voters with our exclusive 12 News Roger Williams University poll. The race to replace Jim Langevin is tight, with Republican Alan Fong leading Democrat Seth Magaziner by six points. That lead is within the margin of error. In the governor's race, it's a 13-point advantage for Democratic incumbent Dan McKee over Republican Ashley Kalis. This week, we break down what you need to know from our exclusive poll on Newsmakers. Welcome to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White alongside 12 News Politics editor Ted Nisi joining us on the political roundtable this week. Longtime pollster and political analyst for 12 News, Joe Fleming. And we welcome back Kara Cromwell, political strategist. And I think, Ted, she has reached uh, regular. Yeah, she's, regular like, she's right in there. Newsmakers. And yet we're not paying her. I know. <laughs> I, I think you Today's get a, the day. <laughs> Maybe. You, you get a T-shirt, so calm down. Ooh, I can't wait. Um, all right. I, I do. Normally, we would start with the governor's race, right? But the big headline out of this poll clearly was the race to replace Jim Langevin. Let's bring up the, the full results on those once again. As you can see, our poll shows that if the election were held today, 46% of likely voters would choose Republican Alan Fung, 40% say Democrat Seth Magaziner, 4% say Independent William Gilbert, who will appear on your ballot as a moderate, and 9% say they aren't sure. The poll comes with a margin of error of 6.2% in the second congressional district. That margin of error changes when we talk about the governor's race. And Joe, because Fung's lead is within that margin right. of error, it's a dead heat. It, it technically it is a dead heat, but if I'm Alan Fung, I'm happy. I'm showing I'm up by six points. When the Globe did the poll back in June or July, he was up by six to seven points then also. So basically, this race has not changed in seven months or yeah. six months. You know, everything's about the same. So even though it's within the margin of error, Alan Fung is in a stronger position at this time. And think about what's happened in those three months. I mean, we've had, I think we've had north of a million dollars now spent between outside groups and the campaigns. Mm -hmm. uh, the Globe poll was taken before the Dobbs decision, which we know has had a major right. decision nationally right. on that. And yet we're in, exa I mean, not only is it still a six point race, it's one point different for each candidate than that Globe poll in June. So, you know, these that's only two polls. Things might have shifted under the hood in that time, but it is is it's very static for such a big race. Mm. And, and polls like this one, public polls, are really important for momentum for the campaigns because then they can go out and fundraise off of oh. them. And that's going to be the primary tool for both campaigns here. Alan's going to say, look, I'm in the lead. Mm. And, and Magaziner Seth is, says, is we, need look, we need your help. We need your help. So the thing that jumped off the page, I know for you, Joe, it, oh, it yeah. did, I, I'm guessing for the rest of the table as well, is when you look at what we like to call the cross tabs, the subgroups, right. where we break down male, female, all that. Nearly 25% of Democrats say they are voting for Alan Fung. That's pretty high, right? That, that's, I mean, that's very high for a Republican in the state of Rhode Island. Republicans usually do well with Republicans and independent voters. They usually don't do well with Democratic voters. If Alan Fung can keep that nearly 25% of the Democratic vote, he's going to be in a very strong position. However, I've, over the years looking at politics in Rhode Island, Democrats and Republicans both tend to come home towards the end of the campaign. So if that happens, if Seth Magazine can make a case for the Democrats to come over to his side, that'll bring Alan Fung's number down. And at that point, he has to do a lot better among independent voters. So the next four weeks are going to be crucial. I would expect the Magazine campaign focusing on Democrats, focusing on the abortion issue, really trying to get the Democrats to come back to his support. I mean, he's getting 63 percent, but he needs to be up to around 80 percent of the Democratic vote. Yeah, I mean, you know, you, I've talked to some Democrats who, who quest, are starting to question this idea of trying to turn Alan Fung into Donald Trump, as you're trying, kind of seeing some of these ads. You know, yes, of course, Alan Fung has said he's going to mm -hmm. vote. He told you, Tim, for yeah. Kevin McCarthy for Speaker, and he is a Republican. But at the same time, Alan Fung's been on the scene so long, I think there's increasing skepticism you can make him a villain. And a a lot of people think even from big time Democrats, Steny Hoyer, Jim, Jim Landry, right. they not say doing nice things and favors Alan, to that message. Right. And they, and, Alan you know, Fung was a Democrat. Yeah, at Alan, one point. He, yes, he was. So, I mean, so I think it doesn't ring true. And I think, you know, to your point, uh, Magaziner's challenge is going to be bring the Democrats home without repelling independence, which is, you know, he really needs to turn out independence. Keep this in mind, four years ago when we were opponent of the governor's race, Alan Fung had a favorability of over 50 percent or about 50 percent. So people like him. He comes across as a nice guy. And that could be a part of the reason why he's picking up these Democratic votes. Also in Cranston, when every time he got ran in Cranston, he did well among Democrats. And especially after he was in office, his numbers were very big among Democratic voters. 
So he but gets a base. You know, and I, we heard, as you said, Tim, from a lot of panicked Democrats and liberals, not just here, but around the country, yeah. who I don't think had woken up to the fact that, you know, if this is a one-seat majority for the Republicans, Rhode Island could be the reason. But the, then why did the GOP know it? Because, as you pointed out, there's been a lot of independent expenditure in this state something we really haven't seen before, as, as you know, because you've right. worked on these campaigns. I mean, what did the what did the National Republicans dump in a million dollars? Yeah, I mean, the um, outside, and that's only so they they could it. put more. In. Well, and to be clear, there are plenty of Democrats who have seen it, but I think there's a lot of others who just sort of watch at a high level all the races nationally. And when they saw this headline that a poll out of Rhode Island in October shows Republicans up six points in New England, one person said to me, "If Alan Fung wins, he doubles the number of Republicans in Congress from New England." That's how weak Republicans it's have gotten up here. It's a big win for Republicans if they were to yeah. win this seat. And he's a minority from New England. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he's got the right uh, Republican roots. It's not like we're picking up another seat in Alabama. Blue, it's something Blue for Rhode them Island to, is a like, battleground state all well, of a sudden. Well, it's just something you know? for the. If we can win there, we can win anywhere. Yeah. I mean, I, I can see it's the, it's kind of the head on the stick. And idea. you saw, I thought like, it was you interesting, know. you know, Charlie Baker, uh, who's outgoing now Massachusetts governor, he did a Boston fundraiser for Alan Fung because I think, uh, and I, I had people say to me, Baker doesn't like Trump. Why is he supporting Alan Fung? And uh, my sense from talking to people around Baker is he sees any, any strengthening of the moderate Republican wing that's been so weakened in recent years as a positive, and they see Alan Fung as a great example of that. If, 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 if Republicans who are more moderate can get him into Congress, they hope that maybe you can build off of that. And if you, could, if you could keep that moderate image up there, that's going to help them greatly four weeks from now. No question. You know, we talked about the uh, independent expenditures uh, in this race, and uh, the National Republicans have this attack ad on Seth Magazine. So I want to just play a short clip of it, and then we'll, we'll sort of break it down. Here it is. We need Seth Magaziner. He supported a tax break for my luxurious new car. <laughs> and the COVID money that bailed out my ski resort. <laughs> Look, all right, so this is an attack ad uh, against Seth Magaziner. Again, this is not a fun campaign ad, but it's an independent, what we call an IE, an independent expenditure. First of all, I just my eye is... <laughs> Your this, television eye on this. You my television this eye on this is anytime they say Magaziner's name, they're never on, the actors are never on camera. So it suggests to me that this is what we, we call a template ad, mm -hmm. where this ad might be playing in other, the National Republicans might be using this ad in other parts of the country, and they just swap in and out the name of the Democrat in, in mm -hmm. different races. I mean, because there's obviously a high production value there. That's not a cheap ad. No, you have all right. the actors and all that. The question is, you, whether it's a template ad or not, does it work in Rhode Island? Is this an ad that is effective? Well, I mean, I honestly think, I thought it was funny, which yeah, is the first, is like, we're laughing about it, right? Yeah. So it's memorable. That's number one. I think the other piece is that it's going to something that Rhode Islanders really care about, which we're seeing in the poll, which is the high cost of living. Right. And, and who, who's uh, responsible for that? You know, Democrats in Washington are going to get blamed for all of the ills right now, whether it's the price of gas or housing, all of the bad things because they're in leadership. And they're going to wipe that on Magaziner but, for the, this race. But isn't the $7,500 tax break they're talking about the front, the electric vehicle tax break, which is something that would be yeah, very think, popular? Actually, all those attacks are off Joe Manchin's inflation law um, because <laughs> it's, you know, using. But look, I've, I've looked at it. They, you know, there is a, a tax breakdown that shows uh, there would be some, you know, pass through tax increases for people making under $75,000. But, yeah, I think the question is, is that, you know, Joe pointed out to me the other day, he said, being rich has not historically been a deal breaker with Rhode Island voters. No, Claiborne Pell, <laughs> Sheldon Whitehouse, I mean, Bruce Sunland, they've elected people that have been very rich. I wonder if they could have done an ad focusing more on um, magazines saying, I want to stop stock trades for the Congress, yet when one of Rhode Island delegation makes stock trades, set magazine doesn't criticize him. He's talking on both sides of his mouth. That would be the ad, and that could be a lot more effective. Yeah, that was an interesting, you know, we had the report on yes. Monday night that uh, Jim Langevin's been aggressively stock trading, which Seth Magaziner's been on the air about. And Seth Magaziner, I've asked multiple times, will not touch Jim right. Langevin's, which of course dilutes how much he claims he cares about that, because as soon as it's a Democrat or it could hurt someone he needs the help of, he won't say boo. <laughs> but do you see Alan Fung criticizing Jim Langevin? So I guess where my brain went when you started to bring right. that up is, oh, Ted and I will be moderating a debate <laughs> in a couple of weeks, and that may or may not come up uh, as part of the questioning uh, there. And how will each of the candidates handle that? Because 
Are, will either candidate want to attack Congressman Langevin on this you, issue? You may not want to attack, but do you want to be a congressman? <laughs> yeah. You know, that could be more effective. I mean, if Fung mentions it, and maybe Jim Langevin won't like it, but he's already supporting Seth Magaziner, you know, you want to build your base to get the vote you need. I, mean, I wouldn't touch that. <laughs> you, well, Why not? Well, you, yeah. I, I wouldn't touch it with a 10-foot pole. I mean, Congressman Langevin has served this district well for a long time. He, 22 years. 22 years. Um, you know, he has uh, the circumstances of him becoming disabled, right, were public, mm -hmm. right? And I think that uh, has a lot to do with his, um, you know, financial situation. And I would, I would never touch that. But that's why some others in the delegation uh, raised their eyebrows when they saw Lang Magaziner go on TV because they knew Langevin right. had this vulnerability. And they said, it's naturally going to be the follow-up question is like, well, if you're so against this. So why this, did he do it? Because they, they need Jim Langevin. It pulled They need Jim well. Langevin. That's, that's oh, why he did it. That's why Magaziner did it. And, yeah, and yeah. I, then when I go back to your template ad, and I agree that it's a template ad, those issues are polling well around the country. So you're putting out a template ad, and you're hoping it raises something with independence in Rhode Island. I mean, if I'm the person who's paying for that, I'm not looking to, you know, oh, will the EV thing play well with the Rhode Island Democrats? Well, I'm they not did, worried about they that. Didn't, they didn't uh, couch it as an EV thing. She brought up independence. You touched on it earlier. Yep. Um, I just want to expand on it a little bit more. Again, um, we have, and we're going to talk about this when we discuss the governor's race. Right. The Republican does well with independence right. in Rhode Island. Does that mean, and have you seen that Rhode Island quote unquote independents are really conservative voters? Well, they have to be because otherwise Republicans only re represent 14% of the vote. So for Republicans to move up, they have to get a lot of independent voters. So a lot of Republicans in Rhode Island tend to lean Republican. Not all of them, but a, a good number of them. So I mean, I think the re independents in Rhode Island are more conservative, but there's enough of independents that vote Democrat. What, what is the uh, spread of the spread independents is, here in this, this CD2 race? Um, I don't have. Oh, I have uh, in front of me. Against Magaziner? It's yeah. 11 points. Yeah, 47% right. of independents in our poll are supporting Fung, 36% right. Magaziner. We should say, Joe and I always say, the crosstabs get pretty small in a, in a smaller sample right. like yeah, this, yeah. so I wouldn't read too much and, in it. And 11 points is not a lot. However, if you're getting 25% of the Democratic vote, yeah. the 11% works. But if the Democrat number goes down, uh, Alan Fung has to move those independent numbers up. And sometimes I think of Rhode Island independents, not all of them, there's some independents who just say independent and probably vote straight Democratic right. every right. time. But I think there's also a lot of independents around who I think of them less as pro-Republican and more as anti-Democrat. They get frustrated with the status quo in Rhode Island, which is inevitably a Democratic status quo, and that might lead them to go for Republicans, but maybe Democrats can pick them up sometimes if they have the right kind of messaging. Um, but I don't think of those people as a happy with the status quo group. I, and they're, I think they're ticket splitters, right? I think they're going Jack Reed, and then they're looking at a Republican governor. You know, they're kind of going back and forth. Um, but as I said, independents, 54 percent of them think the state's moving in the wrong direction. They are strongly against Tidewater Landing. All right, we'll, look, we'll get to all that, Joe. You're jumping ahead, <laughs> all right? No, I'm just talking um, about independence. And we actually have to go to a break, but before we do, Kara, we will be p pivoting to the governor's race <laughs> in, uh, when we come back uh, from the break. But uh, you and I were talking to us before the show. Uh, the turnout in CD2 may help Republican gubernatorial candidate Ashley Kalis, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, the more national money and the more effort that Alan Fung puts into turning out Republican voters, uh, CD2 is more heavily Republican, mm -hmm. more heavily conservative, maybe those cons more conservative independents. That will ac absolutely drive up her number. All right. And just to put a period on the end of the CD2 conversation, you know, David Wasserman, who tracks house races all across the country from the Cook Political Report, found our polling interesting, but he said 46%, he said, getting that last couple points mm. that Alan Fung's going to need is going to be a challenge because we saw, he's, I think he said Fung got 47 or 48 when you split the two-party vote with Gina Raimondo, take out the third-party candidates. So the, clearly Alan Fung has a good, strong plurality, but if a lot of those undecideds are wavering and Sith Magaziner brings them back, because we know a lot of these people have probably voted for Jim Langevin before, so they will vote for a Democrat, that's the challenge for Alan Fung now. 9% undecided. Mm -hmm. Where are those going to go? That's a great question. All right, we're going to take a break here on Newsmakers. As I said, when we come back, we're going to take a look at the numbers in the governor's race. Stay with us. You're watching Newsmakers. From 12 News, your local election headquarters, this is Newsmakers.
Welcome back to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White alongside Ted Nisi, a political roundtable breaking down our exclusive 12 News Roger Williams University poll, joined by Joe Fleming and Kara Cromwell. We're pivoting now to the governor's race. Let's take a look at those results, and we show that Dan McKee has a 13-point advantage over Republican Ashley Kalis uh, in this race. We asked if the election were held today, who would you vote for? 45% of likely voters choose McKee. Kalis gets 32%. Independence Paul Rihanna. Zachary Hurwitz and Elijah Gizzarelli, all in the low single digits. This has a larger undecided amount than in the uh, CD2 race we spent the first half of the program on. 15% of voters say they aren't sure. To the table, is this race McKee's to lose? Oh, I, I think so. Yeah. I mean, look, he's the incumbent. He's a Democrat in Rhode Island. <laughs> That's the reason everyone's so surprised about Alan Funk, because Democrats usually win uh, statewide and federal races in Rhode Island. I, I wouldn't write off Kalis yet. She has a month, as Joe has said. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of undecideds. She's only down in the teens. But I, I was struck, Tim, uh, Ashley Kalis gets 32 percent on a different poll question. We did an early test of Biden versus Trump. Trump got 32%. I think we, we might have that graphic as Ted talks about yeah, it. If so you have it, the Trump-Biden uh, graphic, you can bring that up. Yeah, so my point just being, you look there, you have a former Republican president who I think we can all agree has, has some scars, Donald mm -hmm. Trump at this point. He gets 32% in Rhode Island. Same poll, same university voters. Ashley Kalis gets 32 So she, she doesn't seem, despite, there it is uh, with our early look at the next potentially next presidential race. My point just being, after all the money she spent, uh, Kalis hasn't really gotten far past a sort of generic Republican candidate in Donald Trump, where someone like a Charlie Baker has had to win over plenty of people past the right. presidential vote for a Republican. In I Rhode doubt Island. that's, I, and I, I, well, I don't doubt your numbers, of course, <laughs> but I doubt it's the same 32 <laughs> no. percent, right? I mean, there's a lot of uh, Donald Trump that's name ID, and that's exactly what she doesn't have. Um, if you look at the numbers of people who don't know who she is and are still open to looking at her, which I would call that, you know, that undecided universe, it's absolutely Dan McKee's to, to lose, but I think he could. Yeah. But keep in mind, six months ago, she was at 0% name recognition. Right. So she got her name recognition up some, uh, probably like 60, 65%, but she got her base vote up to 32%. So she can move it up more. Alan Fung got 37% against Gina four years ago. So the question is, can she keep this number moving? She has to get it up in the 40s. Uh, it's a long way to go. You're down to four weeks. However, she's only eight points behind among males. She's only five points behind among uh, middle-aged voters. She's winning the key group of independents, 42 to 29. Again, all these groups she has to expand. Republicans, she's only getting 66%, but they're not going to McKee so much. They're sort of undecided, so she can win those over. So our groups that she can move, the question is, can she move enough of them in the next four weeks? But as we've learned... And, I, and I'm oh. glad, Alex, thank you for bringing up the favorability numbers for Ashley Kalis here, just to, to your point uh, that you made there. So we have 33% uh, favorable opinion of uh, likely Democratic, excuse me, likely voters. That was the last poll. 32% unfavorable, but 35% really don't know who Ashley right. Kalis is. But that number was, as you say, six months ago, was right. zero percent. Right. But the problem is, as Dan McKee taught us in the primary, the election is when the election is. Right. <laughs> you don't get as long as you need to get your name ID up, right? You know, she's now in mid-October with a third of the electorate not knowing her. And as we learned in the primary, it's not four weeks. Dan McKee Two won weeks. because of all the voters he baked voting, in right, yeah. in early voting. Nail and that starts and... within a couple of weeks. Right. So, I, again, I don't want people to misread me. I'm not writing off the Kalis campaign yet. I'm just saying that time really does well, grow short. I think money matters. I don't know how what she's willing to put in in the last few weeks to crank up, you know, her name ID and also highlight any mistakes the governor makes along the way or has made. If, you know, and I, I'm not advising any campaign, obviously, but, I, you know, if I'm uh, Governor McKee, I'm going to do my job for the next four mm. weeks and continue to kind of build that I'm the governor okay. idea. Okay, he's yep. going to do his job and, yep. um, you know, uh, that comes with the position of being an incumbent and that has helped him, no doubt. But the other thing he's going to have in the coming weeks are debates. He's going to yeah. have multiple right. debates. Here are uh, Dan McKee's favorability numbers, 45% favorable, 36% unfavorable, 19% aren't sure. Those are, those are good numbers, uh, obviously, for for Dan McKee, more people have a favorable opinion of him. But in debates, that's, I think, where Helena Folks in the primary was able to make some serious Do you think, crowd. though, Joe and Kara, I'm curious how you read, yes, he took over halfway, but he has been governor nearly two years now, a year and a half now. Mm -hmm. Do you find that 19% 
no opinion on Dan McKee yet. Unusual for a sitting governor with that length of time? I think it's apathy right yeah. now, just general apathy, or they don't really feel like talking you know, <laughs> talking yeah. about their they're opinion, not, right? They're, they're not like, giving their opinions, they're, like, they're not eh. focused. A little bit of that, maybe? Well, you yeah. spotted that um, to me in, the, in the, the Trump question. There was a high, didn't, well, not a, I'm not sure, but a high, refu relatively five, high, 5% five five right. refuse, which is higher than any of the other right. questions. And it does make you wonder if, uh, in that question, that's people who don't want to say. Yeah. yeah, look, I mean, I think we can, well, you we know, know they don't we're say, lucky <laughs> we do have the best pollster in Ireland, Joe Fleming, doing these, but Joe's the first to admit polling's gotten harder, harder right. to get people on the phone, more complex with the mm -hmm. cell phone landline mix, and we know from the national polls experience, and granted it hasn't been as big a problem in blue states, the, the types of voters who've been attracted to Donald Trump have been, it seems, less likely to pick up the phone, yeah. less likely to answer questions. So, uh, you know, we always want to have that caveat in mind, but there's also some some people wonder if that's more of a Donald Trump election effect, whereas here well, we're really asking Rhode Island questions for the most part. Mm -hmm. Hopefully uh, we're getting closer to the true feelings of the voters. All right, all right let's look at the uh, soccer stadium uh, question that we asked, which we, we also asked this one in the primary, and Correct. it was underwater uh, in the primary as well, but in the general election, uh, it's, it's get, as I think you told me it's sinking now at this point. It's 56% uh, of uh, likely voters oppose public funding for the Pawtucket Soccer Stadium, known as Tidewater Landing, 31% favor it, 12% 12, 12 aren't sure. Look, Governor McKee cast the tie-breaking vote on this in, uh, with the Commerce Board. Uh, so he is the one that, that pushed it forward. The question is, in this campaign with about four weeks to go, will it be an albatross around his neck, or is it not really the issue that people are, that's going to make people flip? It, it could be the issue that makes people flip. I mean, it was underwater in the primary, but now we had an indep independence who so don't vote in the primary. And no subgroup likes it. No not a not single. A, even Democrats don't like it. Right. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if Ashley Kalis takes this and builds a commercial just around this one issue, she could possibly move some votes, especially independent voters. 64% of them don't like it. Yeah. So, I mean, there's the group you can move, and that's what she has to move. But Males, 59%, two groups she needs to move. This but could help I completely help agree with Joe. I mean, I'm not, again, not giving any <laughs> advice, but if this is something she wanted to put forward, she could make some hay with it. Yeah. I just, there's also the, there's always the intensity question. So we know voters right. don't like this uh, right. project, but is that something that's going to make them decide question. at the polls? Right. I mean, I you, agree. You know, because you what? know, we, you know, you look at Gina Raimondo's numbers sometimes and say, this, this person is never going to win an election, right? She's got the bad <laughs> well, job well, Let approval. me put it another way. But it, she had certain things people liked and right. the things they didn't like weren't what they decided For on. the voter that, uh, post Dobbs, you know, uh, where abortion is really key, right. and yet they hate the soccer stadium. Are they really going to vote for Ashley Kalis? Well, that's the question. I, right? think, I think the abortion question overrides the Tidewater Landing question. Yeah. No question about that. And I think people will vote based on the abortion. I'm not sure if this will be the one issue that will get a lot of voters to move. But again, you're looking at getting blocks of four or five percent at a time. Mm. This may move three or four or five percent of the voters. I'm just not sure on the abortion issue if those people are already with Dan McKee anyway. Mm. If that's your number one issue, if you're really considering Kayla. I also so I, I think they're appearing in your poll, not in the Kayla or the undecided column. They're yeah, I guess I'm decided. just talking about, yes, I agree but with that, that, but are, are, you know, can you flip anybody when you, I mean, because Kalis would have to not only draw from undecided, but I think that goes to a vulnerability Kalis has that Fung doesn't. Kalis is affirmatively pro-life. She says she would not have signed the Reproductive right. Privacy Act of 2019. She says she'd veto the budget if this new push to fund abortions through Medicaid and the state employee health insurance plan. Those are clearly uh, more on the anti-abortion side of things. But that's still a liability for Fung. Because but, but, it's, but that's a problem. The Democrats are, they have a much tougher time with it. Fung is right. pro-choice. He sometimes is very garbled in how he says it. <laughs> but if you listen to his actual promises, he says he'll vote for the Susan Collins abortion rights bill if he's in Congress. Now, he won't vote for the maximum of what Democrats want, which is what he's getting attacked on. But Kalis is, is further right on abortion than Fung, and I do think that's an important difference. Yeah, but the, the message that the Democrats are saying on that is it's not about Fung himself. It's, it's the vote that it could be, you know, supporting right. the party, making the Republicans the majority party will have sure. this effect. And right? Democrats can say anything they want. To, but yeah. the fact is <laughs> the next. Sometimes they do. Both parties but, do. But the you know? difference is, uh, well, I guess what I'm saying is, yeah, they're attacking them both on abortion. But Ashley Kalis can't come back and say, 
wrong, right. I'm pro-choice, I will do this thing for abortion rights, etc. All she can say is, I promise not to change anything as long as the Democratic legislature, whereas Fung can say, wait a minute, you know, I, I, I will vote for the Susan Collins bill. So I'm just saying it's a, there's a distinction there. Yeah, yeah, I just don't think it's the top issue right now in, in terms of uh, Rhode Island voters. Well, clearly. we know it's not. We, we know it's not, We right? know no cost of living right. is clearly but, so top issue. So if she's issue. talking to that, yeah. then maybe she's going to get a little bit more, again, making some hay yeah. um, on that issue. 30 cost seconds, of living Joe. may be the top issue. But abortion is an issue people will make that decision on a lot of times, even though it's not number one. I'm concerned about cost of living, but if this person's not pro-choice, I can't vote for them. Yeah. There's a difference. Yeah. All right, well, we have a big week next week, uh, pivoting back to the governor's race. It is the first debate uh, between Ashley Kalis and uh, Governor Dan McKee for the general election. It is going to happen right here in the 12 News studios. It is an hour long live at 7 o'clock on Channel 12. Ashley Kalis, the Republican, Dan McKee. The Democratic incumbent will go head-to-head uh, -head, uh, in this debate. Ted and I are already starting to carve up our questions for, for this one, so we're looking forward to that. Um, so please don't miss it. Joe Fleming, Kara Cromwell, Ted Nisi, thanks so much for joining us. We'll make sure we get you that T-shirt for Give now. Give me a T-shirt. I'll have some popcorn. So <laughs> <watch the debate. laughs> All right. We'll see you next week on Newsmakers.